We've been spending billions and billions and billions of dollars every year on this war on drugs to find out that the government was involved. That's pretty astonishing. Crack in the system. Yeah, Sway in the morning, Shay for five. I wanted to play that clip from a documentary, an Emmy-nominated documentary called Freeway, Crack in the System on Al Jazeera. Um, but there's been many um, pieces that have been done on this man. Uh, Freeway Rick Ross, who's here with us today. We saw him in documentaries like American Drug War, The Last White Hope, um, American Gangster on, on BET. Uh, uh, VH1 Planet Rock History, a crack and hip hop documentary. <laughs> and, <laughs> I mean, shit, if it's a crack expert, he's here right now. Uh, <laughs> and I remember the 80s, been growing up in Oakland um, in, a, in the 70s and 80s and watching how the community and the environment changed and wondered what happened and how did it happen and uh, who was responsible for it. And we found out it was this man right here, Freeway Rick Ross. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> <laughs> no, what we found out is that his prowess in um, selling and distributing and dealing um, in cocaine uh, wasn't of his own doing. It's not, it wasn't possible for him to become as successful as he became at that without having help uh, from the U.S. government. I remember Gary Webb, who was a journalist, who uncovered yeah. uh, the CIA and the government's involvement in the distribution of crack cocaine um, in the United States and abroad. And uh, Freeway Rick Ross actually um, had a, a wrote a book uh, called Freeway Rick Ross, The Untold Autobiography that I, I read a while back. And now he has a new book called Riding with Rick, The 21 Keys of Success, written by himself and Coley Crutcher, who's yes, here with us today. What up, what up, Give him a big up. round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Man, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah, yeah man. No doubt, no doubt. Well, we go back, hey, man. Yeah, we do, we do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, all the way back to the penitentiary when I was sitting in the pen and we used to listen to uh, you and Tech yeah. on, wow. uh, on the radio. You know, that's how we did our time. I'd be sitting in my cell listening to y'all reading my book. Mm-hmm. Um, just just so much, you know, and I used to listen to the artists and I'd be like, that dude gonna blow up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they blow up, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's talking about the world famous Wake Up Show, which is still going. Me and King Tech and DJ Revolution and Sky Hook, we do it every Monday here on Sirius XM. Yeah. You yeah. came in to you and Tech had a really good sit down one on one. We did, we did. I mean just just to to to, to be talking to y'all and, and sitting in the studio, it's like a dream, because I, I had a life sentence when when I used to listen to y'all in, in the jail. Like, wow. I mean, this is gonna be for the rest of my life. I'm being myself, listening wow. to y'all on the radio. So, uh, to be sitting in the studio now is like syringe. You know, it's wow. like it's unreal. Yeah. You yeah. know, yeah. and um, it's just amazing, man, of what can happen to you. You know, once you get your mind right. Once you get your mind right, and see that right there is a major statement. Just to put things in context, and we're gonna uh, kind of hit the surface um you you became what they consider a a a kingpin yeah from what point to what point do you think you was at your peak uh in the 80 from 84 to like 86 they they formed a freeway task force that really like threw me off my pedestal okay Uh, um at that time from from 84 to 86 uh, i was going through at least a million dollars every day of, of drugs uh, when they formed the freeway task force, they started to uh, <laughs> ruffle my feathers a little bit. A you know? real million? Like how? How? Like were you just cash do- money? Cash money? Cash fives, tens, twenties, fifties, wow. and hundreds. A million a day. Every day, every day. You didn't just land on a million a day. It started from somewhere. And in this book, I think Coley Crutcher uh, gives some great analogies of how somebody could become a freeway on uh, Rick Walk Ross. Growing up in the same environment as somebody who could come become a sway, or who could become a Mike Muse or a Heather B, we all kind of grew up in the same environment. But something made us choose different to sit, make different choices. Yeah. Your your author actually became an engineer, right? Correct. Exactly. Correct. An electrical engineer. Yeah. Talk about the analogy why you believe yeah. he was able to take that route. What I what I saw is you know Rick started you know in the game. He was 19 years old. You know what I'm saying? And when I was a 19-year-old, I was no different than him at 19-year-old. 19-year-old guys want cars. He wanted $5,000 to fix up his car. You know, I wanted to get a Corvette. But what I understood when I saw him is like the opportunities that I perceived that I had were different because I was able to read from a very, very, very young age. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that I was good and he was bad. 
It was the fact that I saw that I had different options. So, so co selling cocaine was something that I could have done, but over here I could also choose college instead of cocaine. He didn't believe at that point that he could do that, and so he took the opposite route of selling cocaine. And oh, that yeah. was the difference, the literacy aspect of it, what you believe you can do. Well, for me, college had been shut out on it me. It was shut out. I mean, I was good enough to get a scholarship in yeah. tennis, but I couldn't read or write. He couldn't okay. read. Okay, so how did you go so far till you got to the college age of being a college uh, student and athlete that you didn't know how to read and write? You know, I've, I've been wrestling with that because what, what, what happened is – after you get to a certain point in school, then you start to feel like, I ain't got it. Uh -huh. I ain't that one. So I'd rather get swats uh -huh. than to let everybody know that I'm a dummy, uh -huh. that I'm stupid. Uh -huh. You know, and and, and, and and people wrestle with that. They were like, why, why would you do that? But can can you imagine a kid in school who, who the rest of the kids find out he can't read and that yeah. he's dumb, the uh -huh. punishment that they'll give you. Uh -huh. You know, that swat will last for like, Three or four minutes, but uh, uh, the reticure could go on uh -huh. day after day after day after day, and 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 I felt that what I started to do is I started to hide my illiteracy uh -huh. from people, and and I looked for ways to to disguise it, to uh, 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 to hide it from everybody else, and 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 uh, that was a mistake that I made as as a person to to not ask for help. To not ask for help. And which goes to the name of this book, The 21 Keys of Success. Um, and you actually give different keys that you think people should have, uh, could, could apply to their lives to help them reach their success. And Absolutely. one of them, key number one is humbleness. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. know, and it, <laughs> you got to be humble. You got to. Uh, being humble does not mean being weak or a pushover. Rather, you do not. Uh, rather, you do not elevate yourself above another just because you understand that you're not fundamentally greater than another man. Conversely, you understand that no other man is fundament uh, fundamentally greater than you. From this perspective, <laughs> you live in a mode of continuous improvement because you understand in the reality all men are created equal, but you can make yourself greater by purposefully dedicating yourself to your greatness. You think the boss, uh, yet you work with the effort and determination of an unpaid intern. Um, you didn't have, like, it was too the pride got in your way yeah right no and, doubt and the opposite we were just talking about this yesterday uh opposite of pride is humbleness yeah. exactly right so you didn't apply your first key early on in your <laughs> life <laughs> well you well you know how, how would how would you know unless somebody teach you mm -hmm. yeah you know okay. like we expect our kids out on the street right now to become successful and and, and a lot of the stuff that they're getting is, is straight bs uh -huh. i mean we, we've been to feeding, that We've been feeding our kids straight BS. You know, we feeding them right now that you can go out, sell cocaine or, or pills or all these other things and parlay that into a record career or, or acting career. And, and, and that's BS. You know, with me, I fell for it. I went and watched the movie Superfly. Uh huh. And when I left that theater, Arthur Ashe wasn't my hero no more. Hmm. My hero had became Superfly. And, and I started to act out those things that I saw Superfly doing and, and eventually I became that, that that I thought that I wanted to be. Um, what was the first major drug deal that you made? Because you, you, you say in the book that there's a difference between a drug dealer and, a and somebody that sold, sold drugs. drugs. What is that difference? When Rick became known, he became known for selling cocaine. Okay. He was a drug dealer. Somebody that got famous off of something else, but you go back and in their past they say, oh, I had to sell some drugs to get to where I, where I came from. That's somebody that sold drugs, uh -huh. okay? And so that's the difference. Nobody knew about the tennis. I mean, people in L.A. knew. But when you say the name Rick Ross, you think cocaine. Yeah. And that's what a drug dealer is. Okay. Um, the How did you rise to such a high level? Like... This guy, Gary Webb, talked about the CIA involvement in the drug trade. How did that affect your rise? Well, well, I didn't know about the CIA when I first got started. Okay. I didn't find out about the CIA until I was sitting in uh, in the courtroom and uh, Danilo Blandon was testifying. Uh, but, but I feel my rise came from uh, my determination to be successful. You know, I did not want to be a nobody. You know, I wanted to succeed at something in life. You know, I, I felt that after I had... Um, literally failed in tennis, uh -huh. you know, because I couldn't read or write. So that literally was 
xing out all the work i had done for six or seven years playing tennis you know three four hours a day running the heels mm. exercising and all the effort that i put in it had 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 been wasted they uh -huh. was like you're done if you don't get a sponsor to put you on the circuit then you're done um so when when i started to sell cocaine i was gonna make sure that that didn't happen and and what i tried to do is i tried to uh dot my my eyes and cross all my T's and, and I started to study the business. I studied the guys that was before me that I, I saw doing it. I wanted to know where they was making their mistakes. And I basically took all of the lessons that I had learned from tennis and started applying it to the drug business. Damn. Okay. Um, you, you, you hear it's so ironic cause today without even knowing your affinity for tennis, we saluted Althea Gibson, the late great Althea Gibson in our sports report. Um, what you hear so many young black men wanting to play basketball all the time what made you fall in love with tennis um and how did you start playing tennis well i played basketball too i i, I felt the sports was going to be my way out mm -hmm. basketball football and then when when it was time we was in the, the the ninth grade and all the high schools came down and started to recruit the guys from our school to go and play football and basketball, basketball yeah. and me being so little they overlooked me Hmm. So the tennis coach had always been talking to me because I, I was a good tennis player and he had always been talking to me about coming to his school. So um, I took him up on that offer. So you only started playing in the ninth grade? or it was No, no, no. I started playing tennis at 12. Wow. So by the time I was ninth, uh, in the ninth grade, I was good enough to make uh, uh, junior varsity, varsity and yeah. sometimes I would play, you know, varsity in certain games. Hmm. Um, we're talking with... Um, Coley Crutcher, who's the author, co-author of the book, Riding with Rick, The 21 Keys of Success. Uh, Rick Ross is here uh, with us as well. Um, so you were illiterate. You couldn't read or write, but you could add. <laughs> add and, and you know, you know, we just met with, with Gary V. Yes, uh, day before yesterday. Uh -huh. before, oh, wow. Okay. And, and one of the things that Gary told me about myself is that I was a psychologist. Uh -huh. I could read and deal with people. You know, I, I have a special talent of being able to function with people and 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 the adding part was easy but the functioning with people to get different people to uh uh to network to communicate to talk when they normally wouldn't talk is 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 a trait that uh a lot of people are missing right now freeway rick ross is here in the on uh, this book and when you when you say that uh what gary v told you is you have a knack to connect with people you got these 21 keys right <laughs> and uh, it's a play on the word key, key. Yeah. you know, yeah. twenty one keys. I know what they were trying to do right there. That's a double entendre, ain't hey, I got it. You see what they're doing right there, right? I got it. Okay. Before Cali said the major keys, yeah. so we're doing key different alert. kind of keys. Yeah. You know, different kind of keys. Well, and we wanted to we wanted to try to relate to the people on their own terms because I, 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 everything I do is for my people. Okay. And I'm talking about the people out there that, that's not going to get in Harvard University, you know, even though I couldn't get in Harvard. I done spoke at Brown and uh -huh. in uh, uh, St. John's and some of the biggest universities in the country. Now they allow me to come in and speak because w what I found out is that I had allowed my community to mold me. Uh -huh. to shape me, to make me feel certain ways about how I looked at certain things. But now I reverse that, and now I'm dictating how I feel about everything that comes into my mind. I have the choice to say, you know what, do you believe that or do you not believe it? Uh -huh. Is this for you or is it not for you? And, and, and I think that makes a world of difference. Your community told you being like that. What was that movie you said you watched? Superfly. Superfly. Being like Superfly was cool. Your community told you having that new car is cool. That Absolutely. was important. And now through your experiences, and this reminds me of key number 12. You know, what you're starting to discover right now, find your connect is what key number 12 <laughs> says. <laughs> discover your imagination is what key number. Key and this number applies 12. to what he's yeah, saying. Yeah. It's a, a society functions by employing a sort of necessary evil by creating the illusion that the ultimate power resides with the state and simultaneously downplaying the imaginative power of each individual, citizens feel that the power that governs their lives is an outside entity. This necessary evil has the effect of maintaining general law and order, believes the uh, individual to ignore his real source of power. When the individual discovers his imagination, he realizes that even if the state has the power to sentence him to prison, 
He, by connecting to his very own human imagination, has the power to free himself. And you're freeing you. You freed yourself of the way you used to think. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. it, 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 your, it, your, uh, you see how I'm using these keys? No, no, you, 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 you putting it down. Uh, you, okay. You. Yeah, yeah. okay, so how you're giving back now to help your people, uh, is that to help reconcile the damage that you've done mm-hmm. by being a, a drug dealer and circulating a lot of this poison in your people's community? Well, you know, and, 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 and I, I was thinking about that the other day, and I was like, you know, you did a lot of damage, mm-hmm. so you got to do a lot of fixing. Mm. Yeah, you know, and uh, that's my mission now to 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 uplift that that uh, that I once helped destroy. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and this is the way that I feel that I can do it is by sharing my experience. You know, my first book when I wrote that book, I didn't know if I was gonna ever get out. Okay, mm-hmm. so that book is kind of like my letter to the young people who who might think about. Cause you know a lot of lot of young dudes followed in my in my path. You yeah. know uh, the, the rappers named Lil themselves. Yeah. After you. <laughs> Little Daryl, uh, uh, Felix Mitchell. That's, Felix? that's my guy. You know, Felix, okay. I met D when he was like sixteen years mm-hmm. old. You know, mm-hmm. and and uh, he was just getting started. You know, and to see those guys following my footsteps and 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 come out the same way I came out. Yeah. You know, Daryl just got out a couple of years ago doing thirty five years. Mm-hmm. He went to jail when he was nineteen yeah. years old, mm-hmm. and they give him thirty five years. You know, and and to see that you help put your friends in that position because uh, in a lot of ways I felt responsible for guys like that, mm-hmm. you know, uh, putting them in a position to get that kind of time. And uh, Daryl is now doing like the you. The same thing. The same. He's doing work in the community. <laughs> He's talking to kids in Oakland all the time. Him and Hammer are going into the uh, neighborhoods. They're yes. doing hands-on work right now trying to reconcile. But that's how it works, the, though. Now yeah. the community, now we starting to shape our community in a different way. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like before we well, allowed our community to shape us in one way, but now we know that we can shape it in our way, the way that we see fit. Man. Uh, a freeway Rick Ross is here. I'm going to open up these phone lines, come back and talk more about this story. 888-742-3345. Damn. Give us a call. Did I leave Sway in the morning. all the real motherfuckers in Say the pen? Man, tell me, is somebody out here go- Freeway Rick Ross. Sway in the morning. Yeah. J45. He's with us right now, Freeway yes, Rick Ross, yes. Holy Crutcher, the authors of the book Ride with Rick, The 21 Keys of Success, uh, where Rick Ross um, and Coley uh, talks about the mind state or the mindset of certain time periods and his journey and what he has learned from it and where he is now and some p- general principles that that are transformative across the board. Absolutely. Things that he learned as a drug dealer that you could make applicable to your everyday life, even if you're a teacher or if you're a bus driver or if you work in construction or if you're an executive, some of these tr- these principles are still apply. Are universal. Yeah. You know, and, and that's why I see these young guys out on the street hustling, and, and I, I try to talk to them, and I'm like, man, you know, you know you're a genius. And they'd be like, no, big homie, you the genius. I know, no, no, you the genius because you doing something right now that I don't think I could make it right now to, with all the things that these young guys are up against. You know, mm-hmm. when, when when we were selling drugs, all we had to do was stay off the telephone and um, <clears throat> and watch the informants. But now it's so many other elements that they've added to to catching these guys that that is crazy. And I just believe that once they learn that they can take that same energy and channel it into selling books and doing movies and uh, building buildings and becoming le- uh, electronic engineers that mm-hmm. it's going to be so much greater for us. People people miss out on the brilliance and the things that he knows simply because they look at him as a drug dealer. Yeah. And that's what I wanted to get out of the way. Don't look, don't look at that as the individual principles are universal. You know, you can use electricity to cook a great meal or you can use electricity to kill a man. Uh And that's the whole purpose. Don't look at the cocaine. You know, look at the principles and use them for whatever you do. You don't have to be a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. You can use it for whatever you want. Let me ask you this, man, Rick Ross. How how do... The reason I didn't sell drugs is because of my moral compass. Yeah. My knowing the difference between right and wrong. I wasn't an extra religious guy. You know, I wasn't, you know, 
I did do some things that would be considered illegal, but I couldn't go down that route right, because right. of why nobody talks about that. Like what every drug dealer is dealing with is that moral compass. I know that my growth is coming at somebody else's demise. Well, well you know, when, 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 when I first started selling cocaine, it didn't look like it was nobody else's demise. Okay. You know, we're talking about the guys that was buying and the women that was buying was pimps. Lawyers, doctors, the average day person couldn't afford it. A gram of cocaine was three hundred dollars oh, when I first shit. started, okay. so it was really, really expensive. <laughs> okay, damn. And 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 to me, it was almost like how we look at marijuana right now. Yeah. You know, everybody smoked marijuana almost. Uh, uh, if if you don't smoke, you're in the minority. Uh-huh. So at that time, that's the way it was. Everybody who was somebody was smoking or using. I mean, if if you go down the list of our entertainers, the the list is, is crazy. Some of the biggest entertainers that we ever, uh, you know, Quincy Jones uh-huh. had surgery for cocaine, Don Cornelius, Richard Pryor. So to, to, to me, it was like bring a piece of Hollywood to the ghetto. Do you feel like the uh, influx, what is your take on the influx of this drug being very prominent, becoming very prominent in the in the so-called ghettos or the disenfranchised communities being a, a diabolical plan set to really tear apart these communities and keep us stagnant? Well, well I didn't believe that when I first started. Okay. It was only after um, I started getting all of the information. You know, I'm, I'm going to trial now. Uh, Gary Webb had published his, his story in the, in the San Jose Mercury News. Um, Danilo Blandon had testified. Uh, I saw Danilo Blandon, who they said had sold upwards of over 10,000 kilos of cocaine. He got 28 months in prison. Could, could not understand that when I was in prison with— He got 28 months? Yeah, 28 months. Two, two, two years, years, four months. Yeah, two years, four months in prison. And and I knew guys like Richie Rich, who who just got out. He went to prison at 19 years old. They gave him life without the possibility of parole. He he, he just got out. He did about 35 years. Little D got 30 years. So I started to, to, to look at all of that and say, well, well maybe they've been using this as a weapon. Mm. You know, maybe it wasn't just uh, uh, they were trying to raise the money for the Contras, but Maybe this was a way to get the undesirables off the street, you know, put this attractive little shiny thing out there. And 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 knowing that as kids, we all like shiny things, you know, yeah. we yeah. all like the we like those lights, baby. We like those lights, bright and, colors on those suits. And and, <laughs> and and we was drawn to that that we like, yeah. you know, and and I definitely believe that it was used now, now purposely. I don't know. You know, that's been the question with 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 Gary's story. A lot of people attacked Gary because they say he said that the government deliberately uh-huh. attacked the black community. Uh, you don't believe that? I, I don't know if they did or not. I, I, I can't say for certain that that was their plan, but that's what happened. OK. You know, it wind up being attack on the on the on the black community um at the end of the day so was it a plan or not i don't know but it happened okay man freeway rick ross here i want to take a few callers um in this book 21 keys of success is not a guide to becoming a great drug dealer it's a guide to not becoming to becoming great great okay exactly. simply that simply Perfect. that okay <laughs> okay i got you man i read the book i know what's in it all right uh we got alonzo from cali good morning alonzo alonzo hey good morning how y'all doing doing well, great alonzo. hey what's up rick man well you know yeah. we're trying to we're trying to set the record straight that's right well you know i was listening this morning on my way to work and uh, i wanted to share something with you man uh uh, I was I did some time for selling myself, and um, it just so happens I got caught up and did some time up in Indiana uh, with your uh, your partner in crime, Big Ali, uh, aka Gusto. Yep, yep. Yeah, we was at Westville together, man, and this around the time you uh, was down in San Diego, and uh, uh, Montel Williams did that little show on you. Yep, yep, I remember. Yeah, and. Uh, However they did, I don't know. They found out that Ollie was up there and sent paperwork, and Montel Williams wanted to do a, a show or interview him or something like that. And I remember us being on the yard and talking about it. I had He had like six months left, and I told him, man, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. Did he do it? 
No, he didn't oh, do it. Okay, cool. So he got out then. Because if he would have did it, they would have given him six more years. <laughs> hey, Alonzo, um, it's good to know that you're out and that you're a citizen, man. This way in the morning. Alonzo out and got Sirius XM. He's doing, he doing well. No and doubt. he got a no job. Doubt. He said he's yeah. on his way to work. He's on his way to work. <laughs> Alonzo, you one of us now. Uh, uh-huh. Terrence Jeter from Buffalo. What's your question? What's poppin' T? Hey, ain't nothing, man. Shout out, big man. First of all, Shane for five. I love y'all. I'm listening to y'all. Every morning, man. But uh, I first, I do want to appreciate y'all helping me uh, get these tears out the way for a second while this conversation and this topic is, is is on the radio today. Surprised the hell out of me, man. And that shit is bothering to me. Bad. Talk about man, it. We, man, we as people, man, it's financial literacy, man. This shit got me tight, man. I mean, I, I appreciate your book, and I'm, I, I must say, yes, your, 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 your it's not intended to be a great drug dealer. But, damn it, changing your mindset, you become a great anything you want to be. So I done been through the struggle, man. I done, I done been, I'm, I'm still here rocking in my city, still here pushing positive movement for, for all of my people. And yes, Pops ain't there. Yes, Mom, we need my help. Yes, it's real people, black people. Out here in their thirties now, who would I look like? Asking somebody to smile for me, would I look like looking for a mentor for good? But yeah, you're right. If y'all smoke me a butt, I can be cool with the with with with, with everybody. That's the majority. But if I try to change, if I try to help help everybody who broke as fuck out here. Gucci this, Gucci that. I'm tired, bro. Ain't nobody teaching us shit. Mm. Mm. Shit, bro. We still at the bottom. We don't own shit. Land that I want is gone. Houses that I'm gonna have support to get to build something for my community is it is, is, is everything is done. I'm done talking about it. Shame for five. I'm here. Man, we appreciate that, man. That was that was deep, man. But but that's what that's what we saying at the same time is that how can you know unless somebody teach you? Mm-hmm. And that's what uh, me and Coley's taking on right now. We want to teach our people how uh, how we can get out of this situation. All right, we got Coley Crutcher, who's the co-author of the book Riding with Rick: The Twenty One Keys to Success. And Rick Ross is here. I have a just to try to put some perspective on, on this. Listening to the last caller. Um, I remember a quote from Jay-Z that's saying, like, fame is one of the biggest drugs out here. It's so addictive. But what happens when a lot of you people say, I got to help my moms, like, we got to get out of this apartment. When you, how many cars is enough cars? And how how much jewelry is enough jewelry? And how many houses is enough houses? And how much Gucci is enough Gucci before, like, that drug dealer says, let me get out the game? Is it that hard? Is it that addictive? When When do people say, I had enough, like, when do you stop? Well, selling drugs is, is probably more addictive than, than, than actual using mm-hmm. because when you're selling drugs, there's very few people that will tell you to quit. Mm. I mean, you don't have people coming up. after. In the beginning, when my mom first started hearing that I was involved with drugs, she didn't know if I was using or selling. And she, boy, stop, stop. But after you get so big and so powerful that uh, most of the people around you or eating off of your plate. Mm-hmm. So they're not going to tell you to quit because if you quit, then they don't have anything to eat. So it, it's it's a lot different than a drug user. A drug user, people be saying, you ought to quit that. You ought to leave that stuff mm-hmm. alone. But a dealer is totally the opposite. So right. it gets to the point to where not only are they not telling you to quit, but they start to count on you. And and you almost start dealing drugs for other people. Right. So that, so that they can benefit to continue the addiction. It's, that's where the yes. addiction comes yeah. in. Yes. Okay. How much money, I know what they said in the court, but how much money do you think you made selling cocaine as a whole mm. overall? I don't know, man. Over over my whole eight years, I, I sold drugs for eight years. Okay. Um, I started off with $125. Ali had $125. We put it together. Um, we went from making $20 a week to 
thousand dollars a day to ten thousand a day, a hundred thousand a day, five hundred a day to, you know, we had days that we made as much as three million dollars. We did that for two years. But before that, we had days that we made five hundred thousand. Not profit, though. Yeah. Uh, say, say, for instance, on a, on a million dollar deal, our profit probably was like two hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand. You yeah. got 20 percent on that. Exactly. OK, but you were selling a million dollar at that time was equivalent to how many keys? A uh, million bucks, probably like a hundred keys, ninety 100 keys. keys. Okay, yep. so a million dollars a day. Uh, let's say ninety to a hundred keys a day. That's five hundred keys or six, seven hundred keys a week. Because you didn't take Sunday off to go to church. No, I didn't go okay. to church. Okay, <laughs> all right. And so that's a lot of drugs going in different various communities all on, over on the country. A, so would you say you made over nine hundred million in your time? Not profit, no. Not profit. No. I probably touched. Um, I probably touched a couple billion dollars though in my in my lifetime. A couple of billion dollars. So not nine hundred million. With that money, he could have built the wall. <laughs> <laughs> right? Get out, we wouldn't even be tripping. We have no shutdowns. Yeah. Rick Ross could have paid for the wall. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, what are your thoughts on border on border security? You know, this is a big topic right now. Building the wall can stop people from coming in. Is what a lot of folks believe that drugs wouldn't come in. Nah, yeah. man, they can't keep drugs out of our penitentiaries. My my first, see, when you go to a, to a maximum security penitentiary, <laughs> what they do is they put you in what they call solitary confinement. Uh-huh. You're going to be in a cell by yourself until you get classified to make sure that you can go in the yard because everybody can't go in the yard. You know, if some people go in the yard, they're going to get stabbed as soon as they walk in the yard. So they put you in what they call classification. While I was in classification, a guy OD'd on heroin. Right there in the cell. So what that told me is that they can't keep drugs out of the maximum security max. Yeah. <laughs> Not just the maximum security <laughs> penitentiary, uh-huh. but inside of the penitentiary, there's a maximum security that they couldn't keep drugs out of there. So if they can't keep drugs out of there and these walls are like two feet thick. Yeah. I mean, you, you're going to take a, a, a bulldozer to get through these walls. If they can't keep drugs out of there, then there's no way that they can keep them outside of this country. Freeway Rick Ross is here. Mike Mews. Um, your story is wildly fascinating, bro. And for you to have sold up to $3 million per day, I'm just curious about infrastructure and what does that look like? Because one would think for you to sell that across the country to get through ports of entry and borders that you had to have some type of connection either within law enforcement, um, either federal agents at the borders to control that influx of drugs coming in and out. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Did well, you, you-, you know, my, my supplier was connected to um, the Contras. Mm-hmm. The Contras was connected to the CIA. Mm-hmm. So they use military planes to take supplies to Nicaragua to fight the war. They flew those same planes back to America with cocaine. Mm-hmm. So I never experienced that part of it. I didn't know anything about that part when I was doing it. But uh, once we got into this whole uh, uh, Contra affair with Gary Webb's story. We found out that they were being allowed to use airplanes that wasn't being searched, uh, uh, had, had, wasn't being cleared. You know, it was just like this is a military operation, a CIA operation. Let it go. Uh, they went as far as going to the attorney general, asking the attorney general, because uh, that was a law in the books that said that if a government agent knew that somebody was committing a crime against the United States, that they had to report that. Well, the CIA went to the attorney general and asked him if they could take that off the books. Wow. And they were allowed to take that off the books where they didn't have to report that their operatives were selling drugs. So you were partners with the U.S. government. Technically, I mean, I mean, technically, anybody that was in jail for cocaine had been, what is it called, expo facto, where uh-huh. uh, Ronald Reagan had... Literally, okay, because Ronald Reagan says on himself that he's going to do whatever it takes for the Contras. Yeah. You know, he was fully pledged to make sure that the Contras won that war. But he didn't want to pay for it, so we sold drugs. Well, he couldn't pay for it. Remember, Congress took the money from him. Like, they won't allow uh, Trump to build a wall. Uh Uh-huh. So if Congress go against you to building a wall, you can't build a wall unless you find other avenues to to raise the money. And what Danilo said on the witness stand is that— they got the money from from the arms that they sold to Iran, uh-huh. but it was only eighteen million dollars. And they was like, "Well, eighteen million dollars, we can't fight no war with eighteen million, but we could take the eighteen million and buy cocaine and turn it into forty million. Mm-hmm. And that's how they say they got started. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, here we go. We got this last question. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. With the, uh, so with that being said, as we talk about the, the war on drugs as it stands now, and we see the attack on war on drugs seems to be for the local, particularly black and brown communities, black and brown men, do you feel that it's being misplaced? And should we look at the larger fish in terms of the actual way the distribution and the way the drugs actually comes into America? Should we examine that well, more? Well, well, we can't incarcerate our way out of this problem. Mm. You know, um, it, it's a problem that's too big for incarceration. You know, we would have to lock up 50 million people because there's 50 million people that's involved with drugs. Not only did I study the law, but I also started studying drug addiction when I was in prison. Uh, because I wanted to be once I was not educated, but then I wanted to be educated. <laughs> so I started studying all the different facets about drugs, who uses drugs, why they use drugs. Uh, um, like most people think that blacks use more crack cocaine than anybody else. Not true. Not a fact. Uh, whites use twice as much crack cocaine as blacks, but blacks are easier to arrest for the cocaine than, than whites are. Okay, man, riding with Rick, uh, the 21 Keys of Success, Rick Ross and Coley Crutches, and that's the, they're, they're the co-authors. That's the name of the book. This is obviously a conversation that we could have in an extended form. No you, doubt, yeah, no doubt. And, and I really appreciate uh, your honesty and transparency about it. Absolutely. And, and, I, and I appreciate you trying to reconcile the damage that was done as a result of you being such a success. We have to. We have to do that. Yeah. And uh, what's then? I know you're a businessman. You got a lot of legitimate businesses now. What's next for you? Well, you know, right now I got my man. Come over, not. I got my artist with me. Mm -hmm. um, we we finna put his record out. We we doing it the same way we did the book. Um, say what's up to my man. What's up, man? What's up? What's up? It's your boy, not cool, man. Seven one seven, stand up. What's Whoa. Seven, what? Oh shit, damn. <laughs> 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 the venue, what's 717? What's, what's that? What's that? Yeah. That's, that's my area. I'm from Pennsylvania. Venue, Pennsylvania. Yeah. It's the central Pennsylvania area. Yeah, I'm familiar with that area. What, I'm what's familiar with 717. 717. What's mm -hmm. the name of a song you got out? Yeah. Um, I got one song. It's called Depression. It hit over a million on Spotify, YouTube. Um, um, iTunes. It was it was real like deep because it was a song that a lot of people could relate to. Okay, and what's Definitely. yeah? A lot of folks are speaking about you know mental um, health right now, and so you you been through depression. I mean, I've been through a depression before, and I lost like 20, 20 pounds from it. Uh huh. And but the story from that song was from um, a bro that was close to me. His mom died. His brother died. So. I was really speaking through him with that song, and it touched a lot of people. Give out your social media. Um, it's your boy, Not Cool. That's Y-A-B-O-Y-N-A-K-U-U. -Y -U. You can find me everywhere. I got a song with Rich the Kid out right now, a song with Lil Yachty. We turn it up, man. I got my OG man here, Rick Ross, by me, man. We turn it up. Man. What's the name of the label? Uh, we ain't named the label yet, man. We just right now we just ground, ground, ground. You know, we just come from Atlanta for Super Bowl weekend. We did about ten clubs, and uh, basically what I'm teaching him is is what I've been trying to teach everybody else is that you don't have to have a lot to get started. You know, you can start with nothing if you put the work in, and uh, mm. that's what we're doing right now. We mm -hmm. just putting the work in, man. You know, we're we gonna be shooting the movie too. We finance on the movie. Mm -hmm. um, working with Reginald Hudlin and Kim Harding on the movie. We hope to uh, start shooting in about uh, March and April. Did you and Rose ever get cool? We haven't yet, man. Uh, I reach out to him a few times, you know, and, mm -hmm. and then every time, then I, you know, I take a crack at him for fun. But uh, with me, it, it's all love with me. I have absolutely uh, no hard feelings toward him. Uh, I Toward wish, Ricky Rose, formerly known as Rick Ross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have absolutely no hard feelings, and and I'm hoping that uh one day that me and him can come together and 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 show everybody that no matter what your differences are, you can solve those and and get some money together. It's interesting because I I know him. I re, in my interactions with him, he's always been a great dude. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, uh, real solid lot. Very everybody say right, that mm -hmm. too. Dude, he's mm -hmm. a good dude. Man, That's why cool. I'm like, I yeah. think if you two sat down, y'all probably. Swap so many cool ass stories, man. Y'all yeah. gotta sit down, man. Times are different now, man. Make it happen, Sway. Put, put it together. Uh, put it together, Sway. Sway, put it together. Let me try one Put it together. You ain't busy tomorrow, Sway. Oh, come on, Heather. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I want to thank y'all for coming through, man. Thank right, you for having us. Come yes. back, all right. All right. Uh, the Twenty One Keys of Success. Riding with Rick. The Twenty One Keys of Success. Um, up next, man. We're going to talk a little Valentine's Day. We got a uh, matchmaking expert coming up.
Black 